Last night while chatting with somebody, they reminded me about coffee jewels. These came out back 2011. They were used to keep coffee, get coffee down to a certain temperature because they had a material inside that would solidify and, and turn to liquid around 60 degrees Celsius. So they use these to, to help bring your temperature of your beverage down quickly and then maintain it at that level. So I thought it was interesting in this context of cooling samples. And then today I also published a, an article about trying to debug my uh, Vapor Express profile on the Decent, so go check it out. Um, it started with Robusta. I've still been working through Robusta. So this Robusta was frozen and then as green beans and then defrosted and roasted. Um, I've noticed a slight improvement in taste. So I'm not sure if it's because it was frozen or because it was roasted a little bit lighter than the control sample. So this one is still pulling to the left. Um, I really am considering replacing the dispersion screen with the S-Works one. Uh, but this shot turned out really tasty. Then I made another shot for my wife and I poured it in milk, but it came out really nice. I tasted it, it was this, this blend has been really good in milk. It tastes very chocolatey, even though it's a medium roast. Um, but it kind of went to steam at the end, which was concerning. So I also want to let people know I'm going to the San Francisco Coffee Festival on Sunday. So if you want to hang out, send me a message. In the afternoon, I pulled a staccato shot. And this was the last of the experimental coffee I had from Chromatic. This shot tasted really good. It pulled it a little bit, but I increased the uh, temperature of the second stage. So the first half of the shot is at uh, 113 C, and then it drops back down to 105. So I, I think the only problem is when I slow the flow down, it, it goes from like a good flow to kind of a donut. So you'll see it lose it in the middle. Then in the if you look at the puck itself, you can see a big splotch where water didn't go through, it stopped flowing. I roasted a little bit of coffee, Ethiopian and Guatemalan. And I also got the stand for the coffee jack. So I was able to pull a shot this morning and, and uh, take a video and I'm gonna take some more videos and publish those. I ended the day with a double shot of just a, a blend of two coffees that were towards the end of the bag, so I didn't have enough for a single shot. And I pulled it right into milk to see how it would look. What's interesting about this cup, and maybe it's the pour, is that I ended up with a layering effect where I had coffee on top, coffee in the bottom, and milk in the middle. I didn't drink it like this, I just poured it into a big cup and um, mixed it up with more oat milk. But uh, it looked cool, so I, I thought I'd uh, I thought I'd share. So I'm, I'm doing more of these daily video logs and I got the book, I got a lot of writing. It's, it's, uh, it's a fun time. Have a good day. As usual, I started the day out with a Robusta shot, but I went to pick olives today at a farm, so I didn't collect any data on it. I just tried to enjoy the shot and I pulled it over a stone again. I've been digging around to try to understand uh, what other methods have tried to cool down coffee quickly. One being the coffee jewels and the other being a cup using a similar technology. So I also pulled a shot for the road that I put into milk, into some uh, travel container. I think I have a fellow little travel thing that it's been keeps it nice and cold with some ice and some oat milk and that's my preference when I travel if I don't bring a coffee setup with me which I didn't because we were just going out to the farm real quick and uh, so we picked some olives and picked like 10 pounds and I'm in the process of curing them 
So then uh, this afternoon, I was able to pull a staccato shot. And it's the roast that uses uh, half Ethiopian, half uh, Colombian, uh, this uh, Colombian geisha bean. That's a honey process, I believe, from Sweet Maria's. It's really good. Um, so the shot came out very clear, very, um, very sweet. Um, and it was really a joy to have. So, um, and then I used one of these images to segue into what's going on with my book. I got some channeling going on. I got some, the, the book is shipping, but uh, the boat is stuck in traffic in Oakland. So there's a little uh, traffic jam causing, causing some problems with extraction. This short video shows the regular dispersion screen uh, versus the S-Works dispersion screen, which is sits above this shower screen. So it just shows a water distribution between the two. Um, the S-Works one looks a little bit better, but there still seems to be a bit unevenness on the left side. Then I roasted some Robusta beans that I had added 5% moisture to, so now they're 15% uh, moisture. I, they went a little dark, but we'll see how they do. I looked at the bottom of the puck afterwards and the top, then there's a, um, a spot in the middle that's uh, clearly from under extraction. And I'm still having problems with the shower screen, so I think I'm gonna switch shower screens. I was then curious if I took two large or sieves, so this is 800 microns flipped upside down over 700 microns. And if I just made the copy go through those, would they, that change the uh, distribu grind distribution and affect the shot? So I took a sample before and after, and I'm going to measure it later. So then I pulled the shot. I pulled just a normal staccato tamp shot. Um, and I, I've increased the temperature on the second pre-infusion stage, which usually, would, in this case, I, I, that's all the, the shot just stayed in that pre-infusion uh, stage but it looked more like a turbo shot and it had like a 17% extraction yield at 12% TDS so it's pretty good but I feel like it could be better okay let's talk about refractometers so uh, I got a DI fluid refractometer recently which is supposed to be a, a cheaper digital refractometer than what's available uh, right now, to get a cheap refractometer, you have to get an eye refractometer, which is like $25 and is, can be challenging to read. It's helpful for espresso, but kind of difficult for filter coffee uh, strengths. Um, so I've had an Otago for three years, but these aren't available in the United States. They're only available outside of the United States because of um, legal issues with uh, VST. So VST is the the probably the most well-known re digital refractometer and it costs around a thousand dollars while an Otago is costing around 600 or 700 dollars and a DI fluid costs below 200 dollars so I wanted to collect some data and see how they performed against each other um, so then I talk about this and I talk about some other data that uh, was collected by Socratic Coffee and then I did analysis for it okay so I collected hot and cold samples. Um, for the cold samples, I took the hot sample and I just cooled it down with some uh, cold water. Um, and then I made these charts. So this is a scatter chart of um, DI fluid TDS measurement compared to the Otago TDS measurement. Um, so uh, I have the black line there that indicates this Y equals X. So if they have the same reading, they would be along that line. If they're above that line, then that means DI fluid is reading a higher um, TDS than Otago. If it's below the line, then um, it's reading a lower reading. So there's a slight offset set, and this uh, grows uh, over over time. So the slope isn't isn't um, is an increasing slope, which is a little concerning. However, if you cool down the samples, they're reading the same reading. Um, so what you need to understand from a hardware perspective of um, 
from a hardware perspective is that the there's an algorithm underneath and the algorithm is using the refractive index that it's measuring uh, as well as the uh, temperature of the sample and comparing it to a calibration chart to tell it where the, the TDS estimate should be. Um, so um, one of the issues that the DI fluid has is that it's small, so it doesn't have a lot of mass relative to VST or Tago are, are, are much larger uh, sensors. So um, one of the other challenges with this data is I, I only had one, um, one refractometer. So there was some other data presented by other people and, and they showed interesting results as well. But the challenge is again, they only had one sensor. And when you're talking about like quantifying a, a sensor, you have to know, um, have a better understanding of how that one sensor comes off of the line. So that's where uh, Socratic Coffee fits in is they um, had a, uh, they got a bunch of these and they did some testing compared to Otago and VST. For both Otago and VST, they, they do come calibrated. Um, so they, they have like an actual um, uh, inspection. So they, they, and Otago and VST perform, uh, there's not a statistical difference in performance based on past data. Um, so you can trust that they, they should be falling in line with one another. And the other offset is that in these uh, sensors, you have to do some sort of calibration, but it's uncertain or un, uh, there's no data on how that calibration affects uh, final uh, results. So they took a bunch of data and they shared the data with me and I um, took a look. So they also did uh, filtered and unfiltered samples um, while I, I just did un unfiltered samples. I still haven't seen data that proves convincingly um, that filtering does something to, to be more accurate. Um, okay, so let's dive into some of their experiments. So uh, they the, the first experiment they used is they used a solution of, of sucrose. Um, so you have, uh, this is uh, 10 grams of, of sugar to uh, 90 grams of water. Um, so uh, you you should read uh, uh, the, the TDS should be 8.5. Um, and uh, you can see that, that they took, they made the solution three times. And for each solution, they took three samples. So that's what you have below. Um, so in theory, you should have all the same readings. So if you look at the, the, dot, the two dotted lines, there's a VST and a TAGO. And they both have, uh, they're, they have a slight offset off of ground truth, but it, it, with respect to each other, they're very consistent. However, when you look at the DFT units, um, which is just the, 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 their script for uh, DI fluid, um, they, uh, they have a lot of variance um, across solutions, the three solutions, and even within those solutions, there can be some variance. And then there's a large, the bigger variance is across devices. So like if you had DFT1 and you did this test and you only had one device, you might think DFT has a little bit more noise, but it's pretty close to ground truth. However, if you have DFT2, which is that top green line, it's the very top line in this chart, you would think, DFT is terrible, or there's an offset, a calibration offset. Um, so then they, they did the, the, the next test was with instant coffee. So they took instant coffee and dissolved it. Now, uh, sucrose is the cleanest sample you can do use for refractometry. Um, and if you look at an eye refractometer, um, sucrose samples are very clean. It's very easy to see the line because you're looking for this line um, coming out of the refractometer. Um, so with instant coffee, this, you have three solutions. One of the solutions is way off for, for DFT2. Um, and you can see that uh, VST and Otago, again, this is, this is a lower TDS reading, but they, and they, they are under-reporting, but they are still consistent in their reporting, so, which is good because you want, you want to be accurate, but you also want to be consistent um, because if you can be consistent, then this is a useful tool. So even if you're off by a little bit, you, what you really want to know is uh, are your coffee samples improving uh, or not improving. Um, and so, uh, 
you know, you, you could be off by a large percentage and it really doesn't matter as long as you're pretty consistent. So not that the DFT in these, these cases is pretty consistent, uh, just not like uh, VST and Otago. There's a bit more noise. Um, and there's still this variant. So you, you could have uh, DFT4 and you could, you could be really off from ground truth and say these sensors really have a big problem. Or you could have a DFT5 and again, you're close to that VST and Otago reading. And so it might throw you off. You know, so what, that's one of the challenges of, of this uh, new sensor is trying to understand how uh, it's calibrated across the sensor population. Um, and again, we, I don't have this data for VST and Otago. They, they're supposed to fall within a certain spec, a tighter spec um, coming out of the factory with some quality control. Finally, there's filter coffee. So uh, as these, these are harder. These are three ways to measure um, uh, ground truth, and they, they get harder and harder as you go. Um, so in this case, ground truth was determined by a, a moisture meter that would take a sample and figure out how much water is in there. Um, uh, so again, you could, if, if you just had the DFT2 and Otago and VST, you'd, you'd you really have a problem with the VST and Otago. Um, but the reality is these samples are, the, the sensors are, uh, have a bit of, of, of spread in terms of how they read. Now, part of this could be uh, just a calibration issue. It could be part of the equation that they use to produce TDS from um, the uh, refractive index. It's just, uh, it's difficult to know. Um, and the, the, the biggest thing of these, of, of all these experiments is that we need a bit more data. Um, it's hard to quantify the um, performance of these sensors with just one sensor. So uh, this is where if, if you, if you take, take everything to the average, you can see the, the variation, which is why that sucrose reading is, is really small. Like for sucrose, for this high TDS measurement, um, there, there's not much air, right? And this is, so this is the, the percent air of the TDS measurement, which is why the, the filter samples are lower TDS, but the air that you're encountering is a lot higher because of these uh, uh, these measurements. But as you can see, even Otago and VST, they have, you know, uh, depending on the sample, uh, one to, to 6% uh, error rate. Um, so I, I think, even for reading TDS on filter coffee is very challenging. And in, in my other test results, I found that TDS often behaves really weird around uh, 1% or below 1% TDS, where it doesn't have this uh, connection, this linear connection uh, that uh, TDS does at, at higher readings with uh, ground truth. So uh, my, my aim is is to, to get more um, more data. You know, I've, I've looked at a lot more data in the, my written articles that's come from Socratic Coffee. And DI Fluid is coming out with another sensor, so it'd be fun to take some data on that. But again, this challenge is, you know, if you have a single sensor, how do you know the, the quality of it relative to, to uh, ground truth? And, and the best you can do is say, if you collect a large volume of data uh, how much spread does it have across these samples um, to understand if it's a useful tool for, for you? Because if it, if it has a large variance, then, then it's uh, problematic. Um, and uh, so I, I looked at standard deviation for these and, you know, for these three different experiments and, and uh, Otago and VST obviously have the, the, the lowest standard deviation. Why this, DI, this DFT2 device is is a massive problems. Um, but what's important here is if you focus, if you blow this out a little bit, um, you can really see the differences between these devices. So you could get lucky, you know, you, you could get lucky and, and have a good, good device, but even still, you know, you have this weirdness between this, you know, like instant coffee and filter coffee where, um, it just, it just shouldn't, uh, have, um, it, it shouldn't have this, uh, 
you know, difference between DFT2 and uh, uh, for uh, instant filter. There's a huge difference. Same with DFT1 for instant coffee and filter coffee. There's this huge difference in, in, in AR or DFT4 for instant coffee and filter coffee, um, which is a, a, a little concerning. And I, I'd be very interested in uh, having a deeper understanding of what's going on in the hardware. Because um, again, refractometry for coffee is uh, been around for a decade, but you know the amount of data that's available for it and understanding how it actually works with respect to coffee has has not been well um, uh, well researched, which is what I've been trying to do with a lot of my articles. So um, I hope this helps in your your understanding and. Um, uh, if you like my content, obviously, you know, check out more videos and uh, read. If you like reading, so I, I this is in an article. And uh, check out Socratic Coffee. They've done, they're doing a lot of cool stuff. Thanks. This is the Coffee Jack and I'm, Made another video today of a shot because I got the stand that you can buy for it as well as the tamper. So the stand itself is pretty sturdy and I actually really like the aesthetic look, but what's more important to me is just how to pull a shot with it. Cause typically I was pulling over a cup, but the difficulty of pulling over a cup is it's hard to see uh, how much coffee is coming out. It's also hard to pour over a scale to get the the right uh, output ratio. So we'll try it with the, um, the stand. So in this case, I'm using a coffee that's half uh, Ethiopian and half uh, Colombian geisha. And uh, the, the blend was uh, made before I roasted, then I roasted to about a minute and 15 seconds past the first crack in a hot top. I ground it pretty fine and I do a staccato tamp, which means I dose half of the grounds first, distribute and tamp, and then I dose the second half. And for the bottom layer, I also put like a little divot in the middle. This divot helps mitigate side channeling as it causes a higher density on the sides versus the middle. So usually my baskets are overpacked. So this is about 15 grams in. Um, Cause I found that having less headspace is better for um, most of the machines I've used. And I use my makeshift uh, WDT tool just to move stuff around. But my house and my climate is pretty dry. So uh, my coffee doesn't clump like I've seen others online. Um, I do a very light tamp. I'm just trying to get the surface a little compact and level. I usually tamp with a scale and only go to like 300 grams of pressure. So I screwed in and then I'm going to use a decent espresso machine to produce hot water, but obviously you can produce any water. It's just uh, the easiest uh, water available at boiling temperature for me. So what's nice about this setup is that the uh, stand, I can put the crew cup or any other espresso cup underneath with the uh, Pixis uh, scale. So I try to use the hottest water that I can because the water use, loses a lot of temperature once it um, gets in there. So this water is coming out at over 100 C or the setting is for over 100 C. So when it comes out, you'll see that um, it's starting to evaporate immediately and heat up really quick, which is fine. Um, the screen inside of the water chamber is a little offset. Um, that's been a little loose for me, so I just push it back down. It, it hasn't caused a problem. Um, so actually, that's I, put a, I added a little more water here, and then I... Off camera, I, I pushed it back down, which is like a little stick. Sometimes the water takes a minute. I 
wish I had a stick that could boil my water while it's inside of there. So I set it on there and I usually pump a little slow because I want to get the water into all the coffee without much channeling, but I don't want to have too much coffee coming out. So I want to get a good pre-infusion. And in this case, I had to pump a little bit more than usual because the coffee is newer. So there's more carbon dioxide and it's a little bit harder to uh, get the water all the way through. And usually with a bottomless porta filter, I can see what's going on. Um, well, one of the things I didn't like about this is it's not bottomless. You can only see one hole. So, uh, you know, usually I look for the first couple drops. However, it's works really well. So it's hard to, to complain about not being able to see it when it works well, because the main aim for seeing it is to be able to debug it. So I'm just letting it sit, moving some stuff around, trying to get a better view of it, because you don't need to see the top. What you really want to see is the bottom. So uh, a couple of grams came out during pre-infusion, and then I started to do a slow uh, infusion. I know it's it's gauged to go up to nine bars. Um, most research shows that more than six bars is unnecessary and, and can actually have issues with extraction. Depending on the coffee, I found that a much lower bar will still get a good extraction yield and a good taste. You may not have crema though. So in my case, I think I tried a little bit harder to, to increase the pressure more than I normally do, but there's still not that much crema. And part of this is because the coffee I used, I humidified it afterwards to degas it faster. And so it just doesn't have as much carbon dioxide in it to, to cause um, crema production as, as normal. So, and that's fine with me. I, I don't care about crema. I, I, my primary concern is taste and extraction yield, um, which are, uh, they, they have a correlation. It's not as strong as one would hope because it'd be nice to have a metric that has a very strong correlation to taste, but it is a good metric to understand uh, what's going on and, and understand strength from TDS as well as extraction yield from like, did I get everything out of this bean that I thought I could? So in this case, I, I ended up with 18% um, extraction yield and um, a delicious shot. So, I mean, the, the taste of this shot is, is really because the coffee is very forgiving, given that half of it is a geisha bean. Um, so 11.66 TDS, which is uh, typical or maybe even on the lower side for me. Um, but I need a little bit hotter water to, to crank that up. So if you get a coffee jack and the stand and tamper, I hope you enjoy it. I started today with Robusta as usual. And this one, I accidentally ground it at setting five instead of setting zero. So I reground it at setting zero um, and went off fine. So still pulling a little bit, as you can see, the, the, it's pulling to the left. So I decided to take a look at the shower screens. So I, I, I played around with tightening and loosening the nut on the, or the screw on the shower screen to see if that had any effect. And it was difficult to tell in the side-by-sides. Um, like in this case, it looked like loosening it by a quarter turn was an improvement, uh, but I'm not so sure. So I, I pulled some shots and, and they, they don't seem to agree with that. Pulled a nice shot for my wife's coffee and um, what I like about pulling these shots is I can pull a little bit longer of a shot because it's going into milk 
and it gives me a chance to do something a little bit different. So I ground this coffee a little finer than normal. And um, this shot was a lot more centered, but I didn't take any measurements on it. Then I, I pulled a, um, a regular shot um, using the right grind setting and, and something now it, it it came out a little more centered and this is the screw is loosened a little bit but as the shot progressed it, it tended to the left and it was it's hard in this current profile to bring the flow down to very low otherwise it seems to make this problem worse so the the shower screen or the dispersion screen doesn't seem to be working well at low flow rates Looking at the puck on the right side, you see kind of like a water line, and because um, it was channeling from the right side, so you you it's a much lighter color. And then I pulled a staccato shot, but I went finer on the grind, and uh, that was definitely the right thing to do, because the shot came out uh, a bit more even. It still it it will start on the right and then pulls to the left. And this one, there's a little bit of a, a donut in the center. As you can kind of see before it gets covered up, usually the, the cone will hide a lot of what's going on in the center of the puck, which was the nice thing about a lever machine and doing some uh, pressure pulsing. Um, it still pulls a little bit over, but it had a nice amber color. Um, afterwards, there, there is a spot in the middle, uh, as I could see in the video, and some spots on the side. This is not coffee. This is from olives that I'm curing right now. So I use a lye and water and it Sucks out all the not good stuff. So I just thought I'd throw that in there because it looked like coffee. I took some ground distributions for a little experiment that I'm running um, about sifting and how that affects particles. And that was it. Oh, shoot. It's from Kid Cat. Hey, guys, we gotta go. Come on. Yeah. Yep. Hey, were you supposed to take Nino? Mm -hmm. All right, that's fine. No, we're going to see Miss Karina. I started the day with publishing my experiments on extract cooling. So there's a link in my bio to it. Check it out. It's kind of cool. It's a simple way to make espresso a lot better. 
by uh, chilling espresso right as it comes out. It's something that I've adopted in all my shots now. And I'm curious if there's other ways to do it without some uh, putting something in the freezer. So this is my standard Robusta shot. It was um, Robusta was moisturized up. I went a little finer today. I feel like it came out a bit better. And I wonder uh, how much I need to go finer to compensate for the steam pre-infusion. Um, so this is a, another shot I made for my wife's coffee of uh, another blind. It's still pulling to the left there and getting a shower head replacement or a shower dispersion screen replacement uh, shortly. So this is uh, La Pavoni I'm in the office today. And in the cup is Coffee Julie's. A friend of mine had some and he let me borrow them. So Coffee Julie's have a material inside that um, goes to a liquid state around 70 degrees Celsius. So when you go from a solid state to a liquid state, you absorb a lot of temperature. So the, the, the effect is that you could cool coffee quickly, hopefully. The aim for the Coffee Julie's was to actually keep coffee at a uh, warm temperature for longer. Um, and this is part of what I discuss in the, um, my write-up on extra, extract cooling. So the, the, the only issue is then you have another thing to clean. So, uh, but this shot was really, oh man, it was strong. It was 16% TDS and 21% and extraction yield. I, I miss these lover shots that I've been trying to replicate on the, the decent espresso machine. So these coffee jewelries are huge. Like this is two of them in a crew cup for reference. They're pretty ginormous. So I um, came home and, and I brewed the shot where it was too, uh, too fine. And I put too much coffee in. So uh, I ended up putting it in milk, but um, I, I have to fast forward this video because it it's uh, takes too long. So I just pull the shot and see what happens with the pressure. So what's interesting here is that the flow was around um, half of milliliter per second and the pressure was actually up to like eight bars which is unusual for my shots most of my shots with these new profiles that, that are really pushing on steam end up being no higher than two bars so i've been trying to increase that a little bit and um, this coffee is old so really it, it should extract better uh, this is the same coffee i used on the previous shot on La Pavoni. Um, but then the best part was afterwards I got to see a, a puck that looks a crazy different because this had a lot of channeling, a lot of channeling to the, to the uh, center. So this is the, um, the top of the puck afterwards and um, the whole pattern is a lot darker than the rest of the pattern, which is interesting to me. And of course the center, and the center is not extracted well um, and I think this is one of the deficiencies I see in the shower screen on the Decent. I mean, it's, a, it's an IMS shower screen, so it just has a, a the center really isn't covered. Um, and maybe it should be. Um, I, sorry, not maybe, it definitely should be. Um, so uh, the, the end of the night was a staccato shot. And I've been trying to tweak this. The problem is when I go from, like this is a pre-infusion ramp um, and then I skip to the next stage uh, right around here and that causes the flow to slow down. But the problem is the flow is going really fast on one side and not on the other side. So I'm thinking maybe I shouldn't have skipped the step um, because the shot ended up being 11% TDS and, and about 17% extraction yield. And it tasted really good, but it could have been a lot better. So that was my day. Come back for more tomorrow. I started the day with the Robusta and I was excited because I started looking over uh, an experiment with uh, using dry pucks and comparing the extraction yield to extraction yield measure, measured by 
uh, a refractometer. So that was fun. I decided also to do some sourdough experiments. So I did two coffees. I did Robusta on the left and then a mix of Ethiopian and Guatemalan on the right with um, 70 grams of sourdough starter. And my main aim for this is to be able to bring these coffees to the San Francisco Coffee Festival in case anybody wants to try them. So I also have been pulling again on the Pavoni and um, I didn't get a great angle on the shot, but I want to include, I've been using the Coffee Julies because I wanted to see how well they soak up heat. And when they're at room temperature, they seem to do pretty well for a smaller volume of shot. So I don't think they would do as well for like pour over or maybe a long shot unless they were stuck in the freezer. Um, and I'm gonna do more a, a better test for looking at how quickly it can cool down coffee relative to using a stone instead. Um, but the coffee tasted good. And then I uh, did some shower um, screen test. Um, this is the dispersion screen because I bought the S-Works uh, dispersion screen. So the original is at the top and the S-Works is at the bottom. And it looks like it does a little bit better of a job, but I'm, I'm waiting to get some shot data from it. Um, it was a little challenging to see in this video. Um, but when I pulled a shot, this was a staccato shot. It came out like a super fine staccato because I overdosed it. Um, I put in 23 grams and um, the dispersion screen adds uh, more depth. So you have to use less of a dose. See the like the green coming out? It's like the oils coming out first. That That's indicative that there's... Um, it's, it's too, uh, too much. However, it does come out seemingly more even, but the extraction yield was very low. Uh, it was like 14% or 12%, and then it was like 8% TDS. It was like the lowest TDS shot I've had in months. Um, but it was actually still very good, and that's because of the beans themselves are very good beans. Um, and it's still pulled to the left, which is unfortunate. I was hoping, you know, the dispersion screen would help some, but um, that's to be seen. So from the top, it's just really compacted. And then from the bottom here, you can see like huge uh, splotches where it's just not coming through. So then I pulled a regular uh, staccato tamp shot, again with the Coffee Julies. Um, I think I still overdosed this one a little too much. I, this was at uh, 21 grams, where I typically do 22 grams. And this is in a 20 gram BST, but you can see it comes in on the sides and it comes in a little slow, um, which uh, is an indicator to me that it's, it has some side channeling. However, the TDS was uh, in a good range. It was 14% TDS and it was uh, like almost 20% extraction yield, which is higher than um, the same coffee and the same shot style. Um, so that's really good. Like it's, it's uh, definitely uh, in the direction of, of what I want to see. It's just fine tuning and, and tweaking. So, cause it still had this, this thing to the left side. Um, and then the bottom of the puck, you could still see like, there's this huge splotch to the left. That's, uh, that's where the thing came through. Finally, I looked a little bit at this data from J. Kim that um, you got the DI, fluid the second version of the refractometer so i'm curious to see what other data comes out of this i think the bigger challenge with these is that you could easily have a single unit that's good um, the challenges are all your units to the spec or can you guarantee the spec across all units because even in this one there seems to be a discrepancy in the accuracy for this one versus the Otago, but more shall be revealed. This is my first day with the S-Works water dispersion screen only. And this is my Robusta shot with it, which everything's still coming out to the left. I'm, I'm just really struggling with this. I feel like I need to do some work underneath the, the piece that goes into the water dispersion 
And um, I mean, I feel like the water is dispersion screen is helping, but it's also accentuating the fact that you have this problem in there. Um, so I don't know. I made my usual shop for my wife and, and it's uh, the same, same issue, pulls to the left. So I've been trying to modify the profile, seeing if a flash, faster rate of flow uh, is better or faster uh, acceleration to like my ideal rate of flow is better. But it, previously a slow rate of flow would cause more channeling. So uh, I, a faster rate of flow is not helping. In this case, I just cranked it up at the end, um, but it really came out one side. Um, so on the side, I'm, I'm doing this uh, yeasting these beans. They, they finished after 24 hour yeasting with Robusta or Robusta and my other blend. And I started to uh, rinse them. So I rinsed these a few times and then I let them soak in water for a few hours just in case there's any other residue. I, I don't like that there's a somewhat yeasty or sourdough kind of taste left over and I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of that. Um, but again, the aim for these is to bring these to the San Francisco Coffee Fest and, you know, brew some weird coffee with people. Um, so hopefully that'll all work out well. Then I went over to Chromatic Coffee to hang out with Iver and he wanted to brew some Chemex. So I've only had Chemex, I think two other times, one or two other times, like 10 years ago when they became more in fashion again. And he said, let's brew this coffee from El Salvador. I think he said it was uh, from an altitude of uh, 1650 meters. So uh, it's also just a washed plain coffee. There's, there's nothing, no extra processing. It's just a, a really good coffee from a micro lot up there. And it was a really good coffee. It tasted like what one would traditionally think is coffee. And it had a really good aftertaste. It was very enjoyable. Um, I don't usually drink anything aside from espresso unless I do a cupping or um, someone else brews me pour over, or in this case, Chemex. So it was a it was a very nice treat, and we got to talk a little until I got interrupted by one of the kids. So I went home and wanted to see if my machine was level. So I looked at my machine to see if I could figure out this this issue. I tried to even shove some paper in one side of it to to maybe if it was uneven that would cause an effect. Um, that could would cause this, but it's not. The water came out just the same. So it's filling up everything, but then once everything's filled, it's flowing really fast on the left. So I'm missing a lot of extraction. So part of this experiment has been a lot of bad shots on good coffees, which is unfortunate, but it's gotta be done. It's gotta be done. So oh, I think this one was like, 10% TDS and like 14% extraction yield. It was really crappy. So I took some slow-mo videos of the shower screen. I wanted to see how the water was coming out. It's definitely coming out a lot faster. And once it starts coming out of one side faster, even if it comes out more even later on, you're still gonna have some initial channeling that you don't, don't get over. Um, so I thought it might be screen orientation. I even, rotated the screen and still saw the same problem in the, the next two shots. So I also took off the screen and want to look at just the shower head. So right when it starts, water starts coming out, it comes more out of the left side first. Um, so it's definitely, definitely coming from there. And it's just frustrating. Oh, take a look at the puck. You see, you know, it's, it's mostly uh, light brown on the left side, which is where all the water is coming through. So it's over extracted. Everything on the right is under extracted. Um, too bad I can't eat the puck easily. So then I pulled another shot of a new roast, um, uh, Ethiopian and Guatemalan roast. 
that I humidified for uh, seven days and then I let it sit for another seven days. So it should be closer to like the best time to brew. It came through a little bit better, but then this problem just kept coming off to the left side, you know? Um, I'm almost tempted to stick a piece of metal in there and uh, wonder if I could just force flow to come out easier or stick kind of some kind of mesh screen up up top. Water behaves funny. I think too, part of the issue is that uh, I'm using flows that, that are, are at low flow rates and accelerate up to one milliliter per second. This is a fun puck. This is just sitting on the counter and the light just had a fun effect on it. So anyhow, I, I, uh, I think um, the, the low flow rate is, is stressing the system a little bit and you may not notice it on, on other um, uh, profiles. So this wasn't as noticeable on the other, other profiles. It was only when I started working with steam pre-infusion and, and really started pushing the boundaries of what I could extract. Uh, right now, I think my main limiter of getting up to extraction levels uh, at the same as a, a, my level or lever machine is this, uh, how the water is coming in, you know, the water and, and surprise the water is coming in more even. I mean, at least on a lever machine that the water is coming in like a donut, which is fine because you can deal with a donut. This, you have to, you'd have to lopside the, the grounds, which would be uncomfortable. So that was a staccato shot. This is the bottom of the staccato shot. So the, the right side is, you know, mostly not extracted. The left side is very extracted, over extracted, in fact. Um, I think this is probably the crappiest uh, staccato shot I've pulled in months because of the profile. Even from the side, you can see that the, the water is just going all to one side. So, you know, you normally talk about channeling in, in little bits, and this is just like major channeling. Ah. Well, that's enough for today. Now, maybe I'll do some data analysis. Hope you guys have good coffee tomorrow. Another day of frustration with the water. So it keeps coming in on the left, and I decided tonight to finally tear down past one more layer past the uh, dispersion screen. I'm going to pull that one out and see. Maybe there's something clogged. I don't know. Um, but the shots are still coming out okay. You know, but the, the problem is in the, the stream where it's really blonde, is really over extracted and, and the rest is under extracted. So it's just an uneven extraction going on. Um, and I... So I, I reverted to an older profile that uh, wasn't getting as good of extraction, but was not prone to this air as quickly as the current profile I'm on. So this one, the water came in a little slower and it was able to slow down a bit, uh, but it's still coming through on the left faster. And this kind of picks up speed as the shot progresses. Um, and then I, I took this shot on the road and put it in a fellow little mug with some ice, made a very nice iced espresso. Um, but I, I can't get this pause for my other profile without it channeling too much. And part of me thinks that you slow down for the pause and the pause itself can cause channeling if water is flowing on, in unevenly, like if it's slightly uneven makes it worse. Um, I also took my, um, my dried beans out of my oven and they left a little stain on the, the pans. I thought it was cute, but I, I have some uh, sourdough processed coffee now. And this beauty of a shot is produced by a Matzer flat burr that I couldn't get to grind finer, but it was the one I, I, I've been using from one of the offices at work. So I take another look and I might have to just switch to my manual grinder while I'm at work. When I got home, I had to look for my previous shot and you could see this big splotch from the top on the left where the shower screen was. So it's just another indication that uh, this is definitely a water problem. 
I didn't pull any staccato shots today because I thought it'd be a waste considering I'm having this major channeling issue. Uh, but I did take the coffee that was ground too coarsely on the previous grinder. I reground it using the niche and uh, it pulled a decent shot. But um, again, you just still have this problem from the left side. So here it pulls out really, gets really nicely dark color, has a nice pause. But then as more water comes in, it just keeps going to the left. So the other profile, it just came out sooner. And um, this one has a, a little, little bit of a slowdown, which uh, is, is better to manage this issue. Part of me miss, misses using a lever machine because with the lever machine, you just have this such control over what, uh, how you adjust. And I, I have been a little nervous about doing that on the, the descent, even though you can control each stage manually. So I took off the dispersion screen. I did another slow-mo video. So the um, left side of the, the, where they always have the problem is at the top here, the two holes right by the screw on the top, and then to the left, the two screw, two holes by the screw, though that's the left side, that's, that's water's coming through bad. So I'm gonna take this whole piece off tonight and take a look underneath and see there's a problem and, and try to do a cleaning on this as well. I, I don't know if maybe there's a buildup that's causing this unevenness, but whatever the case is, I need to get down to the root of the problem.